Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today for our chapter book story time. We're here at the Caribou Public Library. I'm Miss Erin and I'm glad that you decided to join us today. We are starting a new book. It is called Little Britches When Oh Father and I Were Ranchers by Ralph Moody. This is actually a biography written by Mr. Moody about his time when he was growing up in Colorado with his father ranching. So we have we're going to be starting off with chapter one today, and um, I hope you guys really enjoy it. The first chapter is called, We Move to Colorado, which sounds like a good place to start, doesn't it? I never really knew Father very well until we moved to the ranch on the Fort Logan Morrison Road, not far from Denver. That was just after my eighth birthday, right at the end of 1906. When we lived in East Rochester, New Hampshire, he worked in the woolen mill, but it wasn't good for his lungs. He was sick in bed the winter before we moved. The one after Hal was a year old. Cousin Phil lived in Denver and came to see us the next spring, right after father got well enough to go back to work. I liked him a lot. He had a gold front tooth, wore a derby hat cocked way over his right ear, and he sold gold mine stock, gold mine stock. One afternoon, when Grace and I got home from school, he and Mother were talking in the parlor. I didn't have much chance to listen because Mother told Grace and me to take Philip and Muriel outside to play until supper time. But I did hear Cousin Phil say, Why, ma'am, there just isn't any work at all to ranching in Colorado. We have 365 sunshiny days in a year, and all a man has to do is toss out seed in the spring and harvest his crop in the fall. Without my connections, I could make a deal to put you, oh, with my connections, I could make a deal to put you folks on one of the finest ranches in the country where you'd have all the milk, butter, and eggs you could eat and half of all the crops you could raise. Why, in one year, Charlie'd be a new man and make as much money as he'd make here in East Rochester in a lifetime. I guess father and mother believed what he said because there were letters from him all through the summer and fall. Then, just after Christmas, we had our auction and took the train from for Denver, all seven of us. Father and mother and Grace, Muriel, Philip, Hal, and I. Grace was older than I was, but the rest were younger. All the way out the train out on the train, I kept guessing about how big the house and barns on our ranch would be, and how many hundred horses and cows there'd be on it. It was late when we got to Denver, so we rented a room in a little hotel on seventeenth Street. The next day, cousin Phil lent us his rubber-tired buggy, and Prince, his sleek little seal-brown driving horse. Father let me go to see our ranch with him and Mother. I didn't really have to ask him to let me go. I guess he just knew how much I wanted to and said to Mother, do you think there'll be enough room <clears throat> for you and the baby if we squeeze Ralph in between us? We could see our new house from a couple of miles away. I knew it must be ours because cousin Phil had told us that it was three and a half miles west of Fort Logan, the first house on the Morrison Wagon Road. From the hill beyond the fort, it looked like a dollhouse sitting on the edge of a great big table with a brown tablecloth smoothed out flat all in front of it. It was right near the edge of the mesa where the land started dipping northward into Bear Creek Valley. Away toward the south, there were brown rolling hills as though the tablecloth had been wrinkled a little. Not far beyond it, Toward the west, the hogbacks rose like big loaves of golden brown bread sitting on the table. High above them, the snow caps of the Rockies glistened in the afternoon sunshine. As we came near, it looked less and less like a dollhouse and more like just what it was, a little three-room cottage that had been hauled out from Denver. It was propped up on four cribs of movers' timbers and sat at the corner of an unfenced quarter section of barren prairie land. The chimney was broken off at the roof, and most of the windows were smashed. When we turned off the wagon road, a jackrabbit leapt out from under the house and raced away through the clumps of cactus and soapweed. But it was going to be our ranch. It looked all right to me. Father and mother didn't say a word, but when I looked up, the bunches of muscle at the sides of father's jaws were working out and in. They always did that when he was trying not to get mad. Mother's face was as white as Hal's stocking cap and her eyes looked as though she were going to cry, but she didn't. After father tied Prince and helped mother out of the buggy, he held me up so that I could look in one of the windows. 
There wasn't much to see, except that the floor was covered with broken glass, and plaster had fallen off the walls and ceiling. While I was still looking in the window, Mother said, Charlie, I don't see how in the world we can do it with only $387. I thought, of course, there'd be good buildings and stock and machinery on it. We've got a lot of planning to do. Her voice sounded hoarse and seemed to be coming from way down in her throat. Father didn't say anything until he had stood me down and taken Hal from Mother. Then he put his arm around her shoulder and hugged her up against him. Father was real tall but slim, and Mother's head fitted in under his chin. There's only one thing to plan about, ma'am, he said. Oh, mammy. And said, that's get, and that's getting tickets home while we've still got the money. I won't have you live in any such godforsaken place as this. They stood that way for two or three minutes while father's hand padded up and down on mother's shoulder. There wasn't a sound except that little dry cough that father had then. When mother lifted her head, her lips were pressed tightly together and her voice wasn't trembly anymore. The Bible says, trust in the Lord and do good. So that shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. The hand of God has led us here. We shall have our sh have set our shoulders to the wheel, and we will not turn back. The next two days were not good ones for me. We stayed right in the hotel room, and Father was away from early in the morning until long after dark. There was nothing for us children to do, and I guess we made Mother nervous. Grace and I had two or three squabbles. She was the oldest, nearly two years older, and always smarter than I, and I always got the spankings. When father came in the second night, mother said, Ralph can neither stay out of mistress himself nor let any of the others. I declare I shall go frantic if I have to have him cooped up in this little room another day. Father didn't scold me at all, though. He just put his arm around mother's shoulder and said, There, there, ma'am. I know it. I know hard how hard it is for all of you. We'll get out of here just as soon as we can. The next morning I went with father and we got a team of horses and a wagon and harness. They were all kind of old and second hand, but they were ours and I was proud of them. Father let me name the horses. I called the white one Bill and the other one Nig. We got up before daylight every morning for the next two weeks, Sunday and all. First, we'd pick up any of the bargains mother had found for the house and then buy second hand lumber, plaster, glass and other things that we needed on our way out to the ranch. And father would never stop working until it was so dark that he couldn't see to drive a nail. He got a man to come and help him dig the well. <clears throat> and some days cousin Phil drove out and worked on the barn with us. It just had three sides and a corrugated iron roof. By Thursday night, the barn was all finished and father had built a new chimney, patched the places where the plaster had fallen off and put glass in all the windows and made front and back steps for the house. My part of the job was to sweep up all the broken glass and plaster and pile up all the little pieces of board besides the back, oh, beside the back steps. There was nothing left to, but to build the privy, right? The bathroom of the outhouse. It was just five o'clock when father and I drove up to the depot platform Friday morning. After the baggage man had found our two trunks, we went around to the hotel and picked up everything we wouldn't need for one more night in the room. We had to tiptoe in to get the things because all the other children were still asleep in the shakedown. I hadn't seen any of them when they were awake since the Sunday before. The sun looked only about a foot high when we stopped at the feed barn on the outskirts of Denver. Father bought a sack of oats and four bales of hay there and we fed the horses. While they were eating, we went to a little store up the street and father bought a pail of milk and a whole custard pie. We ate it sitting on the curb beside our wagon. Father knew just how to buy a good breakfast. At Fort Logan, we stopped at Mr. Green's general store and bought more groceries than I thought we could ever eat. There was a barrel of flour and a hundred pound sack of navy beans and salt pork, molasses, sugar, rice, and a whole case of evaporated milk. We got out to the ranch long before noon. Cousin Phil drove out that afternoon and helped us with the privy. Father saw the two by fours and spiked them together. Then, while he was making the door and the seat, Cousin Phil cut cupboards, cut boards, and nailed them to the sides of the roof. 
he cut some of them too long and some too short. After a while, he tossed the folding ruler over to Father and said, This confounded rule ain't accurate, ain't accurate, Charlie. Father folded the ruler up and put it in his pocket. He didn't say anything until Cousin Phil had gone for another board. And then he said to me, If you just remember to measure twice and saw once, you'll get along all right. The last thing we did was to tie Bill and Nig in their new barn, and Father hung the harness on spikes that he had driven high up on the barn wall. He said that was so the coyotes wouldn't gnaw on them during the night. The sun had gone down, and the whole sky beyond the mountains looked as though it were on fire. I looked back at our ranch as Cousin Phil drove us into Denver, and I wouldn't have traded it for anything else on earth.